Jason as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley. I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. In the height of space race fever, American watchmaking giant Bulova wanted a piece of Moonwatch action. So they independently approached Commander Dave Scott and asked him to take a prototype watch on Apollo 15, the ninth manned Apollo mission and fourth to land on the moon. In 1971, Commander Scott obliged, and he took his unofficial, unauthorized Bulova as his backup watch with him to the moon in lieu of a backup Omega Speedmaster. After 230,000 unauthorized miles of riding dirty, that backup would come into play after Commander Scott's primary watch, a NASA-issued Omega Speedmaster, broke halfway through the mission schedule. For his third and final surface EVA, Scott wore the Bulova. Doing so made that watch the only privately owned watch ever worn on the moon. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather, in my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully They'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. For all these years, after the lunar missions, while every government-owned Speedmaster sat in the National Archives, Dave Scott's Bulova was just sitting in his house. Fast forward to 2015. Now Colonel Scott wants to cash in. The watch goes to auction, it sells for $1.6 million, and Bulova commits to making a recreation of the watch that everyone can buy. Enter the Bulova Moon Watch. Before I really get into it, I just want to point out that uh, this isn't 100% standard Moon Watch. Um, I took the dial from a 2017 version and put it in the case from a 2015 uh, to try to get a version that was as accurate to the original as possible. Um, I made a video detailing that procedure. Uh, check it out if you're interested. Um, I think it's totally worth it. Anyways, let's get to this watch. We're going to start right off with the dimensions. Um, before we start, though, check this out. So we got the Royal Swiss Made Calipers endorsed by two old school German woodworking equipment technicians. People, this is the most precise tool on the planet. I don't care. There are seven layers of precision. Swiss Made Calipers, old school German woodworking equipment technicians. Amazing. Anyways, let's get... Let's start off. Um, the only measurement that's really important is the lug to lug. We've got this gigantic barrel case, and even though this is a big watch, it doesn't wear entirely as big as you might think. I'm gonna get into why. Um, this is the only measurement that really matters, and it's the lug to lug measurement of about 52 and a half. Um, if you get a ruler at, at your house and you, and you lay that over your wrist, and, and, and your wrist can handle this as, as in it doesn't stick over like this or like, or like this at the end, then this watch is going to fit you. And I'll tell you why. Even though they say this watch is 45 millimeters wide, and that's what you get if you measure it, um, it wears a little bit smaller than that. I think it wears about 41 millimeters, and I'll explain why. That happens to be the exact diameter of, um, of this sort of raised bezel part right here of the case. Um, let me just show you, right? So we've got 41 millimeters exactly across this raised area. And I really think that that's more of a functional size of this watch. That's a concept that I wanna get into on this channel. Really trying to quantify how big or how small a watch wears relative to its given size. And then for the thickness, we see about 13 and a half millimeters. Lastly, it's going to wear a 20 millimeter strap nicely. Here in comparison is another watch of about the same size. Um, this watch is 41 millimeters. I'll just show you right here. It's a Dan Henry 1939. It's a pretty fun quartz chronograph right here. 41 millimeters in size. And um, as you can see right next to each other, these watches kind of appear to be the same size. Um, definitely this has, you know, the, the moon watch has significantly longer lugs. Um, but if you can handle the lugs, you can handle this watch for sure. 
um, review coming on, on, on the Dan Henry soon. This is this is really cool, but uh, not nearly as cool as this watch. If you, <laughs> you know, spoiler alert, this watch is way better. Okay, so let's flip it over and take a look at the case back. Uh, this is really a cool feature of this watch. Um, you can see that Bulova tuning fork logo, um, really high quality, really deep engraving. Um, everything is just really well done, alternating between bead blasted and polish finished. Um, the quality is excellent, but uh, the material is even better. So we see the Apollo 15 with admission dates. We see that it was the third extravehicular activity when this watch was used. Vehicle in this case referring to the spacecraft and lunar module. Uh, we can see the, the that, um, that EVA took place on August 2nd in 1971. Then we come to the bottom two lines, which might not be as immediately apparent. Um, we've got Hadley Rill. Hadley is the name of the Rill. Um, what is a Rill, you might ask? Yeah, I didn't know either. Um, and then we have Apennine, which is a lunar mountain range named after an Italian mountain range here on Earth. Um, and then lastly, we come to some, are you ready for this? Selenographic coordinates. Basically a fancy way of saying moon latitude and moon longitude. That last sentence is proof that putting moon before any word makes it sound awesome. <laughs> Just saying. Let's flip this over and work the other side. Okay, so let's take a look and start off with this dial. Um, it's a three sub dial chronograph, monochromatic, white on black, on stainless. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Um, immediately, it does look a lot like a Speedmaster, but that's for good reason. So in the early 60s, NASA sent a list of specifications to about a dozen or so manufacturers, including Omega, Bulova, and Rolex, among others, with guidelines for what the Apollo program required in a wristwatch. Um, Omega got the contract, and the rest is history, uh, but the parameters were very specific. I'll see if I can put it on, on, on screen. Uh, three subdials, white and black monochrome, etc., etc. Uh, what this means is is that this watch is extremely legible at, at all angles as well. Um, no problems with no problems on that. When we take a look at, a little bit closer at uh, some of the details, we can see we have three subdials on a slightly lower level. On that same level is a running sub seconds track around the outside of the dial. Um, also sunk in. There's a lot of great depth on this perimeter. You can see that running sub seconds track around the perimeter. And those applied indices just create a really cool shadow effect and just really great depth. That's one of the great features of this watch. Um, one of the things I didn't touch on was the difference between the 2015 and 17 versions. The dial on the 15 version has um, a slightly different typeface and it has a date wheel as well. Um, that date wheel gives it really nice depth because it's sunken further below the subdials. But I gotta say, the print quality on that date wheel was lousy. It's like they got the dial printed perfectly and then they had some old dude fart out some numbers onto a date wheel and call it a day. I mean, it's just bad. This watch looks so great and it's like they took the date wheel from a just a different watch entirely and just shoved it in there. So um, that's probably my only real gripe with the watch uh, in terms of, of really lackluster quality. Um, but if you switch the dials like I did, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy I made the swap. Again, check out that video in the, in the description. If your sub-seconds dial on the cro uh, chronograph seconds or the, uh, the second hand on the chronograph aren't aligned at zero when they're reset, you can advance them by pulling out the crown and messing with the pushers. So don't go too far with the main seconds, because um, if you do, you got to push it like 300 times to get it back. And that was a pain in the ass. So now let's talk about the hands. We got really nice and long pencil style hands. They go right up to the sub seconds track for the minute hand. The hour hand goes right up to the indices. Really impressive. Speaking of indices, we do have applied rectangular indices, um, index style hands on the sub dial as well, um, in addition to an arrow style seconds hand for the chronograph. Um, the sweep is two hertz. I quite like that. It breaks up the monotony of a one hertz quartz tick, and it does so in the most battery efficient way possible. In terms of how much noise this quartz movement makes, sometimes cheaper movements will, will uh, make an audible tick that you can hear across the room. This is perfectly silent. That's a feature of this movement, which we'll get into shortly, but it makes no noise, so you can't use this with a time grapher, fun fact. Let's talk about the function of this watch being a chronograph. So it's a timer and it's got a tachymeter scale. 
Um, let's see if I can explain the tachymeter scale in 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, pay attention to this quickly moving subdial. I'm could because I'm going to talk about it. But let's here we go. Okay. So if it takes you 15 seconds to do one thing, you'll do 240 things in an hour. If it takes you 30 seconds to do one thing, you'll do 120 things in an hour. If it takes you 45 seconds to do one thing, you'll do 80 things in an hour. And if it takes you one minute to do one thing, you'll do 60 things in an hour. If that one thing is travel a mile, your units are miles per hour. If that one thing is make a sandwich, your units are sandwiches made per hour. Get it? Got it? Good. Check the subdial stop now. Did you see that? Okay, so that subdial stop to save battery while the chronograph is still running. I think that's a great feature. Um, it's still storing the subseconds in its memory. Um, so when you depress it, that that hand will shoot to to where the subsecond hand <clears throat> to where the subseconds were. So let's see, boom! Did you see that exactly? So it jumps to 0.25. Very cool, a little party trick of this uh, watch. Then when you press it again, it continues to run for another 30 seconds. After which it will again stop to conserve battery. So one of the differences between Dave Scott's watch and this version is that um, the original was a 12 hour chronograph as specified by NASA. This is a 60 minute chronograph. Uh, I actually like that a lot more on a quartz because that means when you inevitably forget to stop the chronograph, it only runs and kills your battery for one hour instead of 12. Let's talk about the crystal. It's full sapphire, box style, sitting on top. Um, it's not a perfectly 90 degree angle. I'm not sure I'll be able to show that on camera. Um, there is an ever so slight chamfer to that edge. I think that will do a little bit to help impacts, but um, I still don't see this as the best watch against impacts, especially compared to a traditional chronograph design with an exterior bezel. It has AR coating on the inside, but it's hardly stingy with reflections. And um, this thing is an absolute smudge magnet. So, I mean, if you can swing it, you may just want to pay a guy to follow you around with a squeegee. The pusher action is very tactile, very responsive. If I had to describe it to somebody who didn't have this watch, maybe similar to a video game controller um, joystick pushing in, um, but maybe a little bit beefier on the watch. I don't know if you can hear that, but they do rattle and rattly watches suck. So that does stink. Thankfully, it's not too bad. Um, it hasn't bothered me. But if you're a real stickler about that, I could see that bothering you. Now let's talk about this movement. It's an in-house 8136 ultra high frequency quartz that uses a proprietary three prong quartz technology operating at 262 kilohertz eight times faster than a standard two prong quartz. This movement is sweet. To start with, this movement is thermally compensated. Um, just wanna say as well, thermal compensation doesn't refer to one specific thing. There are many approaches, all with one goal, and that is to reduce the effect of temperature variance on the movement. We're gonna be talking about three aspects of thermal compensation in this movement. So the first is inherent to any ultra high frequency movement. And that is kind of a brute force approach to, to thermal variance. Um, this movement has such a high frequency that temperature imparts less of an effect on each resonance cycle. So essentially you're kind of beating temperature variance into submission. A little bit more elegant is inherent in this quartz movement's design. And that is because a three prong quartz functions different from a regular two prong quartz. The three prong design creates a torsional resonance instead of oscillating resonance, which you find in a normal quartz. This is important because it's a natural property of a torsional resonator to be much less prone to temperature variance than a standard two prong quartz. It's built into the technology that this isn't going to be as thermally affected. Very cool. Now, admittedly, those first two examples are what you might call passive thermal compensation. Um, you could almost call it thermodesensitizing. In addition to that, in an article about the precisionist movement on how stuff works, Matt Cunningham reports that Bulova engineers did in fact incorporate active thermocompensating circuitry to even further account for temperature variance. And that's a website that, I, eh, that tends to be accurate. What does this all mean? Well, accuracy, all right? This watch is wicked accurate. Accuracy wise, this is to regular quartz what regular quartz is to mechanical. Um, 10 seconds per year is the listed spec. Uh, in other terms, that's three parts per billion, but I'm getting even better than that. Since setting this thing to GPS time some seven or eight weeks ago, I am now running at less than half a second fast. I mean, do the math. That's tracking toward three seconds per year. I mean, what do you want me to do with that? What do you want me to do? Three seconds per year? 
I mean, what's the holy grail of accuracy? One second per year? I mean, this is three. Three! I mean, this is one of the most accurate watches ever made, and that's not hyperbole. Sure, there are more accurate watches that set themselves every 24 hours by a radio signal to atomic time, but that's cheating. I mean, that's like paying a guy to break into your house every night and set your watch, okay? That doesn't count. Another byproduct of this beautiful quartz design is efficiency. Um, it's another natural property of a torsional resonating quartz. Despite eight times the beat rate, this watch will run for a year and a half on a single battery, more if you don't use the chronograph as often. From an engineering perspective, this is an extremely elegant quartz movement design. It's naturally much more accurate, it's much less prone to temperature variance, and it's much more efficient than regular quartz. This really is what quartz should always have been. I almost forgot to talk about the hacking seconds. The seconds hack, but only when you pull the crown out to the second position. That means if you're rocking a 2015 release, uh, you can adjust the date without losing your accuracy. That's great because at the end of each month, you don't have to worry about uh, losing that pinpoint accuracy. Um, however, the seconds do stop when you pull it out to adjust the time. Um, it would have been nice to have an independent hour hand, meaning the ability to adjust for time zones or daylight savings time without, um, without losing your running seconds. Um, this watch doesn't have it. I'm not sure I can complain about that on a $290 watch. It would have been great to see if this watch would have had an independent hour hand, um, you would have only had to set this watch once when you put the battery in. That would have been very cool. This watch is certainly accurate enough to, uh, to, to do that. Um, but you are going to stop the time and lose a little bit of accuracy when you set the watch. Um, having said that, maybe this isn't the best option for you if you're a huge traveler. Um, on the other side of that coin, though, if you've got an ankle bracelet or maybe you're full-blown incarcerated, this would be a great watch because, you know, you're not traveling. Onto the water resistance. It's a non-stellar 50 meters, but uh, that's really all you need. I'm not sure with a pusher design like this, it would be even possible to get much of a higher water resistance than that. But if you recall to those NASA specs, I mean, NASA only needed 50 feet of water resistance. So if this is good enough for the moon expedition, this is good enough for you. You know, I couldn't postpone it any further. Uh, we have to talk about the loom and it's awful. Uh, it works, but it's bad. I mean, if you wanna know what it's like to have cataracts, try reading this thing in the dark. If you're at home right now and you don't have one of these watches and you wanna know what it's like, Take your watch, put your hand behind your back, and try reading it without moving your arms. Basically, that's what this is like in the dark. Um, enough said. Okay, so let's talk about what you get with the purchase. To start off, you get the box before the box, then you got the box. In the box, you get two straps, you get a strap tool, and you get your instruction booklet, you get some information about the Apollo 15 mission, and you get your Bulova Certificate of Authenticity. Interesting if you want to read that. I thought that was pretty cool. But um, in this box, you get a strap tool. I gotta say, this is way too wide, but it does get the job done, and it does look cool. I think it's more about presentation than functionality. This is a non-standard strap. I have this because I sold the carbon fiber woven pattern leather strap that came with this watch. I thought it was a really poor quality strap. Um, I didn't even wear it. I sold it before I wore it once to some sap on eBay. Thanks for the 40 bucks. And uh, I bought this phenomenal strap with that cash. Uh, definitely worth it. So here we have the other strap that comes with it. This is the real reason I bought this version. You can see here on the, on the patch, the date of mission in 1971 and the beat rate of this ultra high frequency movement. Um, this is a NATO-like strap. It's actually a two-piece strap, but I like it for a few reasons. Number one, it's very easy to show off the case back. With the NATO strap, you basically have to take the entire strap off to show the back of the watch. But with this, you just slide it through one keeper and you can very easily expose that very cool case back. Another reason is that you still have the functionality of the NATO strap in that if one of your spring bars is lost, you don't lose this watch, but you don't have two lengths of nylon running under the watch. This is a very thick watch to begin with, so if you had twice the nylon running underneath, it would sit even higher. Let me show you real quick a wrist check. Doesn't really ride too high again because of that strap construction. I really, really, really like that. Um, I don't think this watch wears big. I think it wears very nicely. Now, every watch is an exercise in compromise. Um, there is no perfect watch. You know, for example, this loom is awful. The print quality on the date wheel in the 2015 version is lousy. Um, 
that uh, you know, the lousy woven leather strap, and the pushers occasionally rattle. But uh, that's about it. I mean, these are all pretty minor issues. Overall, this watch is awesome. 100% um, recommend. So like and subscribe if you found my first YouTube review entertaining. Hey, thanks for watching this far. Um, just wanted to include a little teaser for the next pr review or showcase, I guess. There's a 50-year-old watch. There's no point in reviewing it, but I might as well tell you a little bit about it. Um, here's a Bulova Accutron from the 60s. This particular one is 1968. Um, it's a 38-millimeter pilot's watch that went into space on the wrist of X-15 test pilots. This is such a cool watch, and I can't believe nobody has talked about it. So make sure you subscribe, and uh, you won't miss it. I've got a lot more coming, so stay tuned, and thanks for watching.